of 2 Corinthians. Now, if you're not familiar how to get there, it's really pretty easy. If you at least make your way to Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, turn your pages to the left. You're going to go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, work your way through the Gospels. Then you've got Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, and then there's a second letter to the church at Corinth, and that is 2 Corinthians. Corinthians, and we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 in just a couple of moments. There was a young man who was in love with two women, and he could not decide which one to marry. He was really struggling with this, and so finally he went to approach his pastor, and his pastor asked him a very pointed question. He said, describe the two women to me. And so the man noted that one of the women was a prolific poet. And the other woman that he was madly in love with made mouth-watering pancakes. And so the pastor responded to him with very keen insight. And he said, I see your problem, young man. You cannot decide whether to marry for batter or for verse. As for you, Jim, (laughs) if you follow Jim on Facebook, you see some of the worst jokes and puns that there are on the planet. So, oh man. Well, you're you're welcome. Yes, thank you. (laughs) Well, it's good to see you. We are in our third week of a series called Dating and Marriage. And two weeks ago, when we began this study, we talked about and looked at what the Bible says about singleness and being single and that it is an ordained lifestyle and God recognizes that. And we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and how singleness and marriage are both gifts from God. And Jim did a masterful job last Sunday speaking about sacrificial love and really helping us understand the importance of the five love languages. And let me remind you that we have several resources available for you at the Launch Center on the five love languages. And if you've never read the book, if you've never gone through one of these inventories, let me encourage you to do that. And you pick up the one that matches your current lifestyle and work through that, and it'll help you understand your love language. And guys, I think it's important for us to understand our spouse's love language in certain ways. And so this morning, though, as we pick up this series, Dating and Marriage, and really, it, it really goes beyond that to all of our relational aspects, we're going to camp out in this second book of Corinthians and try to gain a little bit better insight into what we should look for in those dating relationships or marrying relationships. The title of the message is Dating the Right Mate. Now, let me say this. I, I recognize that throughout this series, that may not always apply to where you are in life. I understand that. But let's make sure we also understand what 2 Timothy 3.16 says. And it reminds us that all Scripture is inspired by God. And that it is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and for training in righteousness. So whether or not this directly applies to you, can I just tell you, really doesn't matter. Because if it is inspired by God and it is the Scripture of God, then it is profitable in every relationship arena that we engage in. And so maybe you're not dating. Maybe you're already married. Maybe you're a widow or widower. Maybe you've never been married. We recognize all of those relational aspects. But here's the thing. This will guide us. It will give us tools and resources when we engage in those relationships where maybe a a family member of yours or a co-worker or somebody random because you're living out your faith in front of people and they would say, can you help me understand this relationship that I have with somebody? And you can speak truth into that. You can be a life breather into somebody where this might be more applicable to where they are today. All Scripture is inspired by God, and it is profitable for the righteousness that we all seek. So please, keep that in mind as we journey together this morning in 2 Corinthians. Let's pick up in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, and I'm reading from the New American Standard this morning. Paul writes, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, 
For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Verse 18. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, verse 1 of chapter 7. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness In the fear of God. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you this morning for the reminder that your word inspires us and calls us, Lord, to correct and to teach and to rebuke and to train us so that, as your word goes on to say, that we would be ready in the moment to give an answer for the reason that we follow you, for the reason that we believe that we should not be unequally yoked. And may it not just be an opinion, but God, that we would have the foundation to stand upon the truth of your word. So Lord, teach us this morning. Give us new insight and new opportunity and prepare us for those times to come where we need to give an answer. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So how do you know who you should marry? I think that's always a question if, if you're engaging or preparing for marriage. It's one of those questions we try to answer. If you're a parent of, of a teenager, as my wife and I are of two, you, you often ask yourself, how do you know who is right for your son or your daughter? You, you pray for Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. And what is it you should look for in a mate? Well, I I think it's important that we acknowledge at the beginning here that there are a number of significant aspects that need to be considered in those relational aspects, but also that I believe that there is one that is far and away the most important element in a relationship. And this one element is more essential than compatibility or age or education or emotional temperance or energy, or interest, or personality, or intelligence, or adaptability, or ambition, or autonomy, or selflessness, or appearance, or musical preference, or humor, or how they squeeze the tube of toothpaste, or whether they're a fan of the cowboys, all those are important. But far and away, the most important dimension is are they spiritually suitable? And if you are searching, if you're in that place in life where you are searching for a mate, then it is pivotal that there be a spiritual match in that relationship. Now, I I want to acknowledge as well that there are times when a believer and a non-believer marry. And the miraculous story of how God's grace affects that relationship and the non-believer becomes a believer. And it is a beautiful story of God's grace and God's mercy. And, but I also think we must acknowledge that that's not always the case. And, and my family is a representation of, of that very thing where my sister dated one man and she ended up marrying him. And she was very particular She had extremely high expectations. I want to tell you, she married a great guy. And he is gracious and loving and hardworking. But in the beginning of that relationship, he was religious, but he was not a believer. But my sister, who is very hard-lined in her beliefs and values, refused to budge. (laughs) And it was because of her example that my brother-in-law came to know Christ and I got to baptize him in in a, uh, a hot tub in Midland, Texas at a friend's house several years ago. It's the coolest thing. But listen, 
That's not always the case. And you cannot approach any relationship, but particularly the dating and marriage relationship, you cannot approach that relationship as a mission project. Are you with me? And here's what I mean by that. I tell young couples this all the time. On a mission project, which are awesome. If you've never been on a mission trip, you need to go. But we often go on mission trips with a, an, an intent, right, to be a blessing, The intent to change the environment or see people changed and transformed. And yes, that happens. But guess what? I've been on mission trips. I've talked to people who've been on mission trips. And they say the very same thing. I went to be a blessing, but they were more of a blessing to me. I went to help change the world for somebody, but they changed me. And that's good. But if you enter into a marriage relationship in a mission project mindset, you are risking being the one who is changed. And that's not good. And so you cannot enter into a relational marriage thinking this is a mission project and I'm simply going to change this person. Be very careful that that is not your approach And I think Paul gives us some good reminders this morning about how we date the right mate. And here's the first thing that he calls us to remember, and that is to recognize the relational restraints. Look again at verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. The tense of this verse that Paul is writing in means stop yoking yourselves to unbelievers. And so there is this implication here that this was something that was way too common in the Corinthian church. Remember, he's writing this to believers. And so he is reminding them, this is not what you are called to do. Stop yoking yourself to non-believers. The idea here is you are risking being mis mated by yoking up with someone who is a non-believer. The Message Paraphrase Bible says it this way, do not become partners with those who reject God. Now this is important because the results of this could be disastrous. And using an animal kind of illustration, Let me tell you how disastrous it would be if two different kinds of animals were to yoke together and a yoke where they would plow the field together. And no doubt, Paul knows this. Paul is recalling Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. And this is in his mind. And that verse in Deuteronomy says, Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Why? Two reasons. Here's the first one. They're different animals. It's obvious, right? They are different species. And an ox was much bigger and stronger than a donkey. They have different temperance. They're going to walk at different speeds. But both would suffer in the yoke. The ox would try to pull the donkey and the donkey would struggle to keep up. One of the animals would be choked. The other animal would be pinched. And this unequal yoking of different animals would cause pain and discomfort to both. Why? Because their purposes are not the same. And they're going to cross that. And it's going to be a conflict. Most donkeys tend to pull away from. Instead of going in the direction they should go. They don't take orders very well. And then the second thought, and this might sound strange to us when we think about donkeys and oxen, but not only are they different animals, but they are different spiritually. You see, in the Old Testament, the ox was considered clean, and the donkey was considered unclean. And so the Jewish people were very careful not to mix the clean foods with the unclean foods. And so there is a spiritual aspect to this as well, not just different animals and different species. 
And so Paul is telling us to stop yoking ourselves to this because you become hitched to a non-believer. They are a different animal. They're pulling in a different direction. Their purposes, their plans, their paths are not the same that you are on. And you are risking spiritually becoming unclean. He would say it in Ephesians 5 verse 7. Therefore do not be partners with non-believers. He even put it more plainly. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 39. A woman who is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But he must belong to the Lord. And the same idea. You can find in the Old Testament prophet book of Amos. Amos chapter 3. And if you prefer the King James Version. It says in that translation. Can two walk together except they be in agreement. You see we have to be cautious. And recognize the relational restraints. That are in place when a non-believer and a believer. Yoke themselves together. It's not a mission project. And we have to be careful that we don't risk becoming unclean in that environment. Now the second thought is this, and there's actually five sub-points to this one. And I'll go through them rarely, uh, fairly quickly. But the second thought is that there are reasons for relational restraints. Five of them to be exact. So Paul says you need to recognize those relational restraints, but then I'm going to give you reasons why. Because it's as if that Paul is anticipating that the people might interject to him, hey Paul, you know some non-Christians are really nice people. And it's not a big deal to be yoked to someone who who is a spiritual mismatch. It's not a big deal, they treat me great. They just don't have the same belief system I have. And so Paul gives us five reasons why we have to be careful in these relational restraints, verses 14 through 16. We're going to look at those. Because, see, the orbit of a Christian and the trajectory of a non Christian, folks, those are galaxies apart. There is a radical difference between someone who knows Jesus and someone who does not know Jesus. And so using really five questions, not five statements, but five questions, Paul establishes here several contrasts between those who are a new creation in Christ and those who would still be considered dead in their sins. Here's the first one. He asks the question, what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Verse 14, where he's talked about do not be bound together. And he says, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? And this word righteousness refers not to those who are better than somebody else. He's not referring to someone who is perfect or someone who is far and beyond someone else. He's not ranking individuals. But he is saying that those who have been given the righteousness of Christ through faith do not have in common those who are wicked. Those who are living in lawlessness. Because see, a Christian and a non-Christian have nothing in common when it comes spiritually. Why? Because they have different masters. One who has given them righteousness through the faith in Jesus Christ and the other who lives for himself or herself. The second question that he asked to kind of give some parameters here is what fellowship can lightness have with darkness? We understand believers are called to live in the light And those who do not know Christ are living in darkness. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The path of the righteous 
is like the first gleam of dawn, shining even brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness, and they do not know what makes them stumble. And so he says, you know, the righteous and the wicked, they don't have anything in common because they got different masters. And there's also those that are in the light and those that are in the darkness. And those that are in the darkness, are they're stumbling around. They're in deep darkness. They, they don't know where they're going. And those that are in the light are following the path that God has given to them. The third question he asks is, what harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What harmony? And this word harmony in Greek is the word that we get for our word symphony. A Christian and a non-Christian cannot sing the same song. They cannot sing to God's glory. They cannot be in holy harmony. And Belial literally means worthless. And it was used as a name for Satan who is the absolute enemy of God. Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. There is a lack of harmony. There cannot be a symphony. You cannot sing the same songs for those who are believers and non-believers. A fourth question Paul asks here is, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? After he says what harmony, he says what has a believer in common there in verse 15. And one lives for the creator, the believer, and the other lives for the creation, the non-believer. And so he says, what do they have in common? Not only do they have two different masters, but they have two different lifestyles. One lives out his his or her calling as a Christian to the creator of the universe and recognizes him. The non-believer lives out his or her life because of the creation, selfish, the things of the flesh, not the things of the spirit. Remind you of Romans chapter 8. You, however, are controlled Not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And then a fifth question that Paul asks, as if he's anticipating these, well, what if or why not? He says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? What agreement? What is he saying there? It's important that we remember the the new covenant that we live under. And we don't have a temple. Yes, we come to a place of worship. But the temple church is us. And the temple is where God dwells. And the Old Testament temple, that dwelling was to never be trampled with unholy behavior. It was never to be trampled or have things that were unclean brought into it. And so if the imagery of the Old Testament temple was not to bring unclean animals or unclean behavior, why then would we bring that into this temple where the Spirit of the Lord dwells today? He says you cannot be so unequally yoked Because there is a difference between the temple of God and the idols of this world. There is a huge contrast between Christians and non-Christians. But it's more than that. The Bible says that there are inherent and intrinsic contradictions. Not just contrasts, but contradictions. And Paul continues to make his case that a Christian should not be yoked with a non-Christian. And he draws upon here in these final verses some 
multiple images and passages from the Old Testament. Let me encourage you, maybe as a way of study this week, we don't have time to plumb the depths this morning of Exodus 34, but there is some great insight there that comes to mind that we are reminded of as Paul is writing here. Well, our time is coming to a close this morning, and let me give you a third and final thought, and that is that we have a responsibility to our future relationship. We have a responsibility. We come to verse 17. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. You see, we're faced with this tough task of obeying God's word rather than following our feelings. And that's the rub, isn't it? When it comes to our relational statuses, we often put how we feel about that person, how we feel in those moments of passion or excitement, intimacy. But a person might know what God says, but their emotions have become so entangled that their feelings are allowed to undermine their facts and their faith. And so Paul says, be separate Come out from that. And this is a command right out of Isaiah chapter 52. And so first and foremost, an inner attitude of the heart is where we realize that we are separated for the Savior. We have been called out to be different. And because we belong to Jesus, we have to be careful not to attach ourselves to anyone who might Pull us away from Jesus. You may be thinking, well, there's nothing wrong with dating someone who's not a Christian or marrying someone who is not a Christian. Or maybe in that dating relationship, you say, I'm not planning to marry him or her anyway. We're just having fun. Oh, that is dangerous, my friends. Because you risk compromising your spiritual commitment and your devotion to Christ with that lackadaisical, lazy approach to your relationships. The most important relationship you will ever have is not with a husband or a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, but with Jesus Christ. And when we receive Him, and He receives us, John chapter 1 says that we become children of God. And quoting again from the Old Testament, Paul says in verse 18, he uses Jeremiah chapter 3, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and my daughters. And because we value our relationship with God so much, we can see that He is not trying to make us miserable, but He's trying to protect us. And isn't that what you desire as a mom or a dad or a grandmother or a grandfather is to protect your family from being unequally yoked? And maybe, maybe you have a family member right now and you've been praying for them and you're asking God to bring somebody into their life. Maybe... Maybe this, this morning you've, you've gained some insight in how maybe you could have an honest conversation with your concerns, with your struggles, with their potential mismatch spiritually. But as I close this morning, let me address one very real thing this morning. And that is that I, I recognize that some of you here are married to someone who is not a believer. I, I know you, I have great respect for you, and I know how much you pray and you plead for your partner to come to faith in Jesus Christ. So let, let me encourage you in, in two very simple ways this morning. The first is this. Don't bail on that relationship. 
Don't bail out. You, you might not always feel it. You, you might not even always recognize it. But you are having an impact in your home if you are living for Jesus. If you are living out the example of Christ, don't bail. You keep going. You keep plowing. You keep praying. And the second thing is this. You keep believing. Don't lose hope. Because your spouse's heart could be warmed to Christ when he or she sees you living for Christ. And so if that's you, don't bail today. You keep believing and hoping and trusting that God's going to use you as a, as a tool of transformation in your spouse's life. Make sure that you are yoked to Jesus Christ. And sometimes we think that marriage is the most important decision that somebody ever makes in their life. But the truth is, the most important decision you will ever make is whether or not you choose to yoke up with Jesus. And Jesus said to take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Why? Because my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Friends, you work hard to date the right mate. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word today. Thank you, Father, how you remind us of how important it is to not become unequally yoked.